Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for having us here today and very excited by what we're doing. I want to echo those comments that Dave Nick made on the phone. Um, just very quickly about me. So I uh, work with Fortis BC right now. I do a lot of, lead a lot of our work on uh, low carbon strategy, policy, that kind of thing. In previous lives, uh, yes, as <coughs> Alice was saying, I worked at the International Energy Agency or the IEA. Uh, a lot of vowels there, but um, I worked there for about three and a half years before coming to Fortis, BC. But I am a, well, I'm originally, Al I'm from Alberta, but I consider myself a, a, a BC boy now. So I've been here since about 2000. And, and before that time, before working at the IEA, I was actually um, a lead analyst at the David Suzuki Foundation. So I've worn a lot of hats. And I will admit that if you go on the deep, Google search on me, you may find some articles that I have published at DSF that were highly critical of LNG. Um, but, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, but, uh, but honestly, that, uh, that's kind of an interesting opening into kind of my story and the story here is, is that um, after joining the IEA, um, not to say I have a more complete view of things, but you do really start to internalize a lot of the, the macro gears of the global energy system there. And um, Canada is an important place and we have a, a big kind of outstanding, we punch above our weight in a lot of respects, but there just are some pretty massive levers that are being pushed and pulled as we talked about, as Dave Nick showed on the phone. Um, and it was really kind of in, in enveloping that perspective um, that, I, that I changed my mind on LNG and I started to understand that, um, you know, we need to have, we need to get out of the provincial mindset here and really look at this from a, from a, global, um, a global perspective. And so, so that's, where, that's where I'm coming from. At the IEA, I, um, I did a lot of work on China, so I kind of have a, some, I wouldn't say I'm an expert on China, but you know, I, we did some really interesting work there, notably on energy efficiency and that kind of thing in, in China, a lot of interesting actions there. And, and so what I wanted to describe to you today was just the IEA's sustainable development scenario, what the role of LNG is in that scenario, and just talk more generally about mitigation pathways and how do we get to those, how do we address the problems, I guess, that that Rob was Rob was talking about. So, by all means, please um, please fire off questions as as we go. And uh, I'm going to throw a lot at you, but hopefully I'll be able to distill the main points fairly easily. So, what are we going to talk about? The IEA has this flagship publication that it publishes every November called the World Energy Outlook. It's this brick. Um, it's this huge 900-page document. It takes about 45 analysts at the IEA to kind of pull together. They work for intensively I and in the in in the in the in a kind of a, a, a energy policy boiler room for you know um, six months to put this thing out. It covers all aspects of the global energy system. And one of the key themes of the World Energy Outlook is climate change. What are we going to do about climate change? How can we transition from where we are to where we need to be? Um, in the 2017 World Energy Outlook, there was a big uh, chapter on LNG, natural gas, the role of natural gas to achieve our climate change objectives. And in that, uh, in those chapters, the main point was, yes, LNG has a, in terms of the global picture, a small but a very critical role in a couple of countries to get them on that trajectory to reduce emissions in line with two degrees of warming above pre-industrial levels. So, um, what would you example? we'll get into it, but um, um, just to say that LNG, at least out to 2040 and 2050, is, can be highly consistent with reducing greenhouse gas emissions in line with our objectives in the Paris Agreement. Okay. Um, if you peel the layers back, then 
the case for BC LNG becomes even that much more crystallized because we'll get into it, but BC LNG is much lower carbon intensity than other places in the world and we have high ambitions here in Canada in terms of climate policy. So it, it is a really compelling case. So that's, what's the, what I, that's what I wanna impart to you today and hopefully in showing you the data and showing you some of the analysis, um, you'll come along that journey with me. So just very quickly, IEA, 28 member countries. Canada is a member, it's an international institution. It was created after the oil price shocks of the 1970s. It's had many, it's worn many different hats, but now it's pretty much considered the, the global center of expertise on energy policy, climate mitigation, and all that. What does the World Energy Outlook specifically do? It develops three main scenarios. There's the current policies, actually they've updated the names for them this year, but what they were always called the current policy scenario. So that says, let's just take all of the policies that are on the books that impact how we, how we consume and use energy, and let's just freeze them in time. And then let's let all the drivers of population growth, economic growth, all of that, let's run that forward to 2040, 2050, and let's see what the impacts are of current policies today out over the next three decades. Then there's the new policy scenario. This is what they call the reference case for energy modelers. This is kind of what we say, what, this is what they consider to be business as usual. So what are things gonna do unless there's no major changes between now and 2040? So, so uh, new policies is all the policies that are implemented and announced. So that's the difference between current policies and new policies. Um, so for example, uh, all of the Paris Agreement commitments, the nationally determined contributions, those are part of the new policy scenario. So new policy says, we are assuming that every country is gonna achieve their commitments in the Paris Agreement. So actually even there, it's, this is a pretty aggressive business as usual scenario because it's, it's uh, I don't wanna be pessimistic, but it's, it's not clear that every country is gonna achieve their Paris commitments by 2025, 2030 just to say. And then there is the sustainable development scenario, which assumes that worldwide we join a global effort to limit warming to two degrees above pre-industrial levels. Uh, right now, actually, the discussion is on well below. Um, and I think you're going to talk a bit about that, Rob. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we can, we can wait for that. But just to say that, you know, two degrees is kind of the upper limit of what we need to do and the well below is, is kind of moderating risk for you know, some certain global catastrophes as if we, uh, if we mess too much with the global climate system. But the other part of that this, the sustainable development scenario looks at is access to energy. So as Rob said, you know, there's approximately a billion people without access to modern energy services. So this is stuff like elect, you know, electricity, refrigeration, that kind of thing. The sustainable development scenario also uh, provides access to those people and make sure that, and also addresses, um, this is very important actually, local air pollution concerns. So in places like uh, India, China, and elsewhere where there are acute criteria air contaminant issues and local air pollution issues, the sustainable development scenario addresses those as well. So it's kind of, it's not just a climate scenario. So to give you an idea of how the how the policies stake out. You know, if we, if we just do policies on the books and we run it forward to 2050, we assume that we don't change any other energy policies from now to 2050, we get a temperature rise of four and a half degrees. If we just do uh, the current policies and all the policies that are announced, the new policies, we get approximately three and a half degrees. Sustainable development gets us to two degrees. Uh, well, this is a, this is, <laughs> I should actually, this is, there's error bars around like about this tall between each of these. So this is kind of a central assumption. Picking out what the degree warming will be in decades time is pretty much a stochastic, it's a, it's a, we basically use uh, stats to kind of estimate what it might be. There's all these different climate models this is what generally is a central scenario is, and that's by uh, 2100. Yeah. 
but just to say there's major moving gears here, and this is just, just an indicative temperature rise. Um, to give you a sense of the level of ambition, current policy, there's a kind of a, a carbon price of about $30 per ton in Canada. The new policies is the $50 a ton. So, so back in 2017, on the books, Canada had a $30 carbon $30 per ton carbon price. But they announced that, you know, by 2022, it's going to get to $50. So that's what the new policy scenario has. But then actually to get to the um, sustainable development scenario, we need uh, in Canada a carbon price of, you know, $125 to $140 a ton, just to give you a kind of sense of the level of ambition that we need. And so, in energy terms, how does this, I think Rob had this slide as well, but this, this shows um, the, the three scenarios in terms of the share or the size of global energy. Okay, so importantly, current policies, actually these are greenhouse gas emissions and that takes us to over 40 billion tons of emissions globally by 2040. And the sustainable s development scenario takes us down to about 18 billion tons. Um, you'll notice, interestingly, actually, that uh, fossil fuels are still a huge part of the global energy system in no matter which scenario. Okay, and, th and this just actually speaks to, you know, fossil fuels, <laughs> they're just, they're really good in terms of <laughs> providing us energy. They're very cheap and they're very accessible and so Rooting them out completely is kind of orders and orders of magnitude more difficult than kind of shaping them down into having a lower share, okay? So, so just to say, but you know, when Rob talks about the 1.5 degrees, these will eventually need to go down to zero. And I just, I, I threw this slide up just because I don't wanna over egg the custard, so to speak, on the role of LNG. Like LNG is in this thing here. Okay, so I don't want you to leave thinking LNG is the solution to our climate problems. It's an important, as I said, important solution for specific countries. But really to get to that two degrees, it's renewables, energy efficiency, it's all that stuff. So I don't want you to feel like I'm saying that you know, LNG is the be all, end all in terms of the global greenhouse gas reduction scenario. So stuff that's in here is nuclear energy, CCS, fuel switching to natural gas and stuff like heavy duty freight or international shipping, and then LNG used to displace coal, okay? Just to very quickly, just not to get too wonky on modeling, but how does, the, how does this modeling work? Um, they develop all of these assumptions on policy and the cost of different energy options, and it's what we call a partial equilibrium model, so various people are trying to op, uh, optimize based on energy prices and they're choosing from different things. It's all, you know, very complex. It's a kind of large integrated global model, but it's basically trying to account for different prices of energy and how people react to those. Um, they're fully integrated, so when somebody over here is demanding energy, that sends a signal to an energy supply sector in the model to produce that type of energy. So just to say that they're all feeding back, they're trying to replicate in terms of a computer and a spreadsheet how the global energy system works. That's actually, you know, is kind of the best we can do, but you know, the global energy system is uh, complex and all that, but it does respond to fairly basic uh, drivers on how to produce and how to consume energy. Um, I don't know, if, Tyler, if this is a good time, but yeah. you might, I think, use the example of the amount of coal to gas switching that's occurred in the United States in the last decade, which hasn't been about climate. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been, been economics. It's been about pricing, but yeah. it's had a beneficial impact on the climate as far as I understand. Yes, yeah, well, that's been the single largest action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the world is that switch in the United States. So, um, so, so just to say that um, it's fairly basic. A lot of it depends on assumptions on energy prices, but it's the best we can do. 
And natural gas demand is stimulated in the models by different policies that make different higher carbon intensity fuels more expensive or make natural gas consuming technologies cheaper, so on and so forth, right? So nobody, uh, when they're modeling these things, is kind of going in and saying, well, you know, in China, we want it to be this or that. They kind of put in all the assumptions, they press go and let the model run, and, and then it spits out, it's like the big bat computer, you know, and it spits out this, this sheet at the end of it. So the point there being is, is that it's not, it's not specific IEA modelers or whatever that are going in and juicing the different numbers. They're, they try to be, they try to, you know, let the computer system run based on the assumptions that we put into it, right? So, so that's, that's the key point there. What happens, let's get into the, this is where it starts to get a bit interesting now. So what happens to, na to gas demand in the three scenarios? Um, well, it goes up in every single scenario. And kind of, it kind of understates a bit uh, when you look at current and new policies, but actually in the sustainable development scenario, globally gas consumption increases by about 20% from now to 2040. It doesn't look like that, but we're starting here and it's still going up by about 670 uh, billion cubic meters per year of gas demand. How much is that? That's about a Russia's worth of gas production. So even in the sustainable development scenario, we are adding a Russia's worth of gas consumption currently to achieve our climate goals. So it's, it's a huge increase in gas that we need uh, for the sustainable development Can you scenario. relate that to BC production? Uh, you're using different, you're using different uh, numbers. For lack of a better way to put it, it's way larger than BC's <laughs> production. Um, well, I'll, I have some other numbers that'll ho hopefully dilate your pupils a bit. And this kind of gets into another theme I want to leave with you today is we talk a lot about power and we talk a lot about um, coal consumption and gas displacing power and gas and renewables competing for that same slice of the pie. Um, yes, that's a, where a lot of gas demand is going, but globally natural gas consumption in power declines by 17% in this scenario. But over half of that growth in gas is going to industry and transport. And this is kind of a forgotten part of Chinese, China's energy system. Over half of energy consumption in China right now is, is, is coal. It's, it's unlike any other country, okay? And there are not a lot of great options for substituting for that coal in industry. You need usually high temperature process heat that's what they're consuming that coal for. And, um, and there simply are, there's, there's not a lot of uh, renewable options there to provide that type of heat. We'll get into that a little bit more. Matt, for you quickly, if you want it. Sure. <laughs> so it was 264 billion cubic meters? Uh, 670 uh, BCM by 2020, uh, sorry, by 2040. So it's 23 tri trillion cubic meters. BC's natural gas reserves are two nine three three trillion cubic feet. Yeah, so still huge. Yeah, five BCF a day. If Dave Nick's on the phone, you know, <laughs> way in here. Yeah, five BCF right now. So we have to turn that into cubic meters. Yeah, I, it's. Aren't you exercising? I know. It's, I'm sorry. So um, just. The IEA is based in Paris. It's it's a metric uh, organization, so I didn't do the conversion. I just pulled the numbers straight from the wheel. Uh, and w and here's the share of global primary energy in the sustainable development scenario. So actually, what ends up happening is that gas occupies the largest share of any one energy source by 2040. You see, there's big declines in oil and coal, huge decline in coal, huge expansion of renewables, but the single largest source, if you kind of untangle the renewables, is gas. So I, I, going back to the, the way the IEA models stuff, they use these price scenarios. So they say like under $150 a ton or whatever it was, that's about the maximum you can get 
theoretically you can, you know, your ability to, to onboard renewables is limited by your, you're not limited by energy. You're limited by your productive capacity to produce renewable energy, right? Like so silicon, that's, again, that would be your, you know, your limiting reagent there. So just, sorry, just to confirm, I think you've just answered my question, but does that, that imply the carbon price? Yes. Okay. So gas is, gas is eating into coal and oil there because gas is approximately half the carbon intensity of coal. So when you put a carbon price on gas, the, the price increases half as much as what the price increase is on coal. And that's at $150. Yeah, uh, the global average carbon price in the sustainable development scenario, I think, is 50 or $60, but it's different per country. So in Canada, it's 140 And then if you wanted to switch to the next slide, we can show actually what that means. What happened, this is gas, the growth in gas consumption by 2040 in the sustainable development scenario. And so you see here, in places like North America and that, it goes down, right? Because that's because we have a $150 per ton carbon tax and that makes gas less competitive compared to other uh, energy sources. But where I want to focus on for the next of this present, for the rest of this presentation is, I had to move these onto a separate chart because the axis would have messed with how this chart looked. And in, China and India, the growth in gas consumption, you know, is, you know, three and fourfold in those two countries in the sustainable development scenario. Okay. In, interestingly, these little diamonds here represent the difference from the new policy scenario. So this says, assuming that we go aggressively to reduce emissions, what is the growth in gas over business as usual? And in fact, gas consumption is higher in China and India in a scenario where you try to reduce emissions by, you know, 60, 80 percent globally than it is in business as usual. So the point there is as the more committed that China and India come to reduce their emissions, the more important gas consumption gets to getting to their targets. That's a really important point, okay? That basically means to say that the more we can send, the more that it will get them on that trajectory to reduce emissions to two degrees. Why are they gonna buy it if it's not, if it's not cheaper than coal? Well, because they also have a carbon price. And they need to snuff coal out of their energy system. So, as Dave Nick was talking, um, there's not a lot of options. Like, renewables will help, but they need everything to get coal out of their mix. Like, so, coal consumption in China is 80% of their primary energy, right? We don't, this is the thing, like, we don't understand the scale of that country's energy system and what's going on there. I was just going to add an answer to that question and uh, that is that it's not purely economics driving gas in those countries, it's policy yeah. and in China it's about clean air. So oh, yeah. they, you know, they call it the clean, the clean cities policy and they want to clean up the air shed and most of the home heating and industrial heating and whatnot in, ch in those major Chinese cities, Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, all those were coal. And so now they're switching to gas in the interim and renewables. And that is the big shift that's happening in China. And so. Is that true in the, um, so Rob, is that, is that true in the IEA model now? Yes. So that, that factors both carbon pricing and um, policy. And other policies like clean air policies. That so if we can move on to the next slide, I'll, I'll, I'll um, give you an example of that. So China, in their 13th five-year plan, they still you know, have echoes of the, uh, the old communist state there. So they have these 
five-year plans. They're kind of their big national policy packages. One of them uh, in this 13th five-year plan was we're going to we're going to put 200 million people onto the gas system for home heating. So they're going to have 400 million people in total consuming gas. You know, 15 years ago it was essentially a Victorian heating system where people had coal stoves in their apartments heating. So most, almost all of those coal stoves are gone and they're using big coal-fired boilers in those, you know, giant apartment blocks that they have there. And now they need to switch those over to natural gas. China's an interesting place. It's, it's one of the only developing countries that has a, a significant cold climate. And, um, and so there's, you know, in that Beijing area, it, gets, it actually gets very cold. And there's a lot of demand for heating. Announcing participants. Um, an interesting aside, just on, just on the sustainable development scenario, when I was talking about providing access to modern energy services and that kind of thing, adopting gas, yes, ad addresses your emissions issues in the cities. It also has another very interesting outcome in that it, right now a lot of people are consuming uh, LPG or liquid petroleum gas uh, for heating and cooking in their apartments in China. That market is constrained by the amount of LPG that you have. It, it's very supply constrained. By switching people over to gas, that liberates all those LPG canisters and they're able to move them out into the rural areas and displace biomass use. So um, they're using traditional biomass in their homes and that kind of stuff in, in, in rural China. And that increases their access to modern energy services, right? So that gets rid of burning you know, uh, stover and all that kind of thing and all the, the bad indoor air quality issues and moves them over to a cleaner form of LPG. So that's what the sustainable development scenario is doing in the background. It's trying to get those people that are using traditional biomass into cleaner forms of energy. Um, just to say here, uh, what is this chart showing? This is the, this is the mix in the various sectors now and in 2040. So the dark blue is coal. So here's, here's China's power sector today. And yes, predominantly the story in power is going to be renewables. But as Dave said, and he's very right, we still need to firm that renewable capacity up. We still need to provide that dispatchable energy that we can command on, on, on a moment's notice. And the question is, is not going to be what is going to supply that renewables or whatever. It's going to be between natural gas and coal. Right? So gas eats into coal's role, and coal can very easily fill that role of being the balancing type of, so providing energy when the wind isn't blowing. They can ramp up and ramp down coal plants, no problem but you're going to have a major emissions penalty if you use coal to do that. What people say is, well, you know, renewables are so cheap that uh, if we use gas, we're just going to, um, we're just going to undercut them and, and limit their share in the market. And it's actually the exact opposite type of relationship. Cheap renewables are making high cost gas competitive versus coal. The question is not gas versus renewables versus coal. It's gas and renewables versus coal. Two, two questions, yeah. um, which are derived from some of these. We're trying to canvas literature of some of the folks that don't agree. Okay, so I'm not asking these questions because I don't agree. Sure. I'm asking these questions to just get more information out. Uh, I still don't know what I think yet. I'm learning for every 15 minutes here, yeah. um, like everybody else, I hope. So uh, two things. One, um, in the I think you helped to write the paper, the International Energy Agency paper, on the role of gas in the energy transition. Um, and there was the four case studies. One was Europe, United States, China, and India, I think. 
in the India case study, the way I understood it when I read it recently was that the case for gas uh, to displace coal, which is used for domestic uses primarily rather than electricity production, um, and they have, according to that uh, paper, nine of the worst t ten polluted cities in the world because of the coal. Um, and the way I interpreted it was that actually the, the opportunity for renewables is so strong in, in India um, and the infrastructure is so poor for transporting gas that they would be better off to rely on the, the oncom oncoming renewables than to invest in the gas and then have the legacy of the infrastructure and the amortization of that expensive infrastructure. That's kind of the way I interpreted it. What, what do you think? I, did I miss the point or? Well, there's, a I don't think you missed the point. The, the, the issue is, as we talked about, we're gonna need everything. Yeah. And India has a lo very large uh, industry focused around extracting coal and burning coal for power. Renewables will simply not be able to fully displace that. So the question is, do we want coal around in India or not? And also, how do we power India's industries along the coasts that are in those heavy industrial belts? You don't need a significant gas distribution system for gas to have a big role in industry because most of them are located in heavily industrialized coastal areas. Right? So, um, yeah, I mean, the, the point is well taken. What I want to say, though, is, is that I don't see nearly as much competition. I think it's a very elementary cr criticism to say that for every unit of gas that is going to go into these developing countries, energy systems, we're actually substituting, that could have been a unit of renewable energy. Like, the other really important thing to understand is China still has not built out its energy system. Electricity consumption per capita in China is half of that of Canada. Okay? So they're not done yet. And there's, th this is another thing we need to wrap our heads around, is there's still significant unbuilt energy supply infrastructure that's going to be built over the next three or four decades. You know, Dave talked on the phone, China has 245 gigawatts of coal in the hopper right now that's being built. Okay, Just to give you a sense of scale, BC Hydro's system is 13 gigawatts. Okay? The whole system. Yeah. Just this past year, they commissioned what was it? Yeah, another 28 gigawatts. They didn't commission. They approved 28 gigawatts. We're nowhere near the world where gas is displacing renewables right now. Okay? Like it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fiction of the mind's eye. The, the business as usual, what's going on on the ground in China's power sector is investing in coal. Um, so, if I could do an aside here, on just talk about a bit about environmental organizations. I work for one. I am actually a climate hawk, is what they call it. Like I am extremely concerned about climate change. I think it's the singular challenge of our times. And and you know, as a father of a young child, I I uh, I stay up at night agonizing over it. Right? It is not something. It's not a light topic. It's very, it's, it's dire, right? That's why <laughs> I want to do things that will reduce emissions now, okay? So environmental organizations, they, uh, bless them, they are doing God's work trying to get us to transition to a clean economy. The dynamics that they face, though, are they have, con they are like any other organization. They have constituents. They have people that follow them. And they have people that they must serve for dollars, for donations, for to maintain their integrity and credibility. And it's difficult for them to come out and say, 
yeah, you know what, actually fossil fuels, maybe they are good. Because a lot of their supporters, that isn't a message that they want to hear. And it's frankly okay for them to say that, you know, they're, they're, there's that thing of the, the Overton window, right? Where they're trying to pull as much as possible people into thinking that we need to move to a clean economy. And by saying, well, you know, actually gas is probably good, that, that doesn't help when they're trying to pull that, that Overton window, right? So that's, that's where they're coming from. At the base level, though, they probably want to see emissions reduced in any way possible today as, as well, right? So just to give you some insight that, that what, their, what their role is is to try and just get us acting as much as possible. And they're not going to do that by being you know, compromising on emissions or that kind of thing. They need to be out there spreading the word. So that's why you'll hear, we don't think gas has a role or, or that kind of thing is that they don't want to give that inch. Moving on. Oh, actually, I just wanted to point out another thing. When Rob talks, ab when Rob talks about um, urban air, the, the singularly largest culprit of urban air pollution is diesel trucks going through these cities. And just to say that uh, gas really increases, I think it's three or four times. Uh, it's a very low base, but gas-powered trucks, again, reduce emissions and improve air. In basically all sectors, it's going up. I mean, look at that in buildings. It almost completely snuffs out coal. Where's the gas going to come from then? If we agree that, you know, it has, a, it has an important specific role in places like China and India, where's it coming from? And the answer to that is it's coming primarily from LNG. There's a lot of reasons for that. One of the other things people will say is, oh, well, um, you know, they can just pipe that in from Siberia. And that <laughs> there's a lot of reasons why that is very problematic. So that Siberian pipeline will be one of the biggest in the world. It's fully subscribed. It's not going to make a dent into this. As you can see there, here's pipeline. And yeah, so it does go up. The Siberian pipeline is, I forget the actual BCM it moves, it's huge. But there are very real geopolitical constraints on how much more pipeline capacity can be built between two countries as, that have as much friction between them as uh, Russia and China. And the Chinese much prefer LNG shipments because it, it addresses a lot of different concerns. Uh, bilateral relations. Um, when you move the LNG from, uh, the gas, excuse me, from northern China on the, the Siberian border there to where they need it, down in southeastern China, it has to pass through a number of different Chinese provinces. Whereas if you bring it in on a boat, you get it right where you need it. Um, just to say that that route uh, between all the provinces is a lot less attractive to many Chinese consumers than it is getting it on a boat from an international market. In terms of LNG, you know, LNG exports from North America make up about 150 BCM a year by 2040. That's approximately double how much Canada exports in natural gas to the United States currently. So there's a huge export opportunity for LNG from North America. The question is, how much of it will come from BC? How much of it will come from the US Gulf Coast? Um, moving on. Very quickly on methane, I just wanted to bring this up just because people also bring up uh, methane as uh, a very important issue when considering gas consumption, and it is extremely important. So methane, depending on how you count it, can be anywhere from 25 to 100 times more potent in terms of its warming potential. Um, but just to say that uh, it looks as though methane emissions from BC sector are extremely low. So just today, actually, the global methane budget was released. And yes, methane emissions are rising globally. In terms of what are the culprits of that, it appears as though it's 
Agriculture accounts for half of it, so livestock, the cows and all their bodily functions, uh, and you know, uh, silage and that kind of stuff staying on the field and rotting. The other half is, yes, coming from oil and gas, but interestingly, it's coming from oil and gas in places like Southeast Asia and Africa. Countries with much less developed regulatory regimes on methane and much less integrity around methane management rather than here in BC. So we have some of the lowest methane emissions and basically the best methane regulations in the world here. So we also need to understand that using LNG from BC actually reduces global methane rather than shunting it off or pushing to some other LNG provider, say in Mozambique or something like that to provide that. We're basically one of the highest, and the, the lowest methane emitters in the world and we have the best regulatory regime around that. Tyler, yeah. can I just clarify, did you say we're one of the lowest methane emitters and why is that? I understand the stringency. We have good regulations. We have a bunch, our, our, our natural gas formations appear to not lend well to methane leaks. You know, this is all, again, like we still need to do a lot more work here on methane, but it does appear like we're one of the leaders globally on reducing methane. The other, the other thing is, one of the nice things about, not nice things, but one of the opportunities that LNG has is it's, it's a greenfield development. So we can, really be aggressive on methane because we're building these facilities new so we can take the time and do the engineering to be very aggressive on eliminating methane and plus all the new wells that LNG will uh, stimulate can also be very aggressive on on methane. One thing is we need to depreciate these assets 30, 35, 40 years <laughs> and then, then be able to walk away from them um, in due time. I should note that that 2040 thing is, is not the end point, right? It, that chart goes out well past that. So industry needs to know that, you know, it's likely that, you know, in 2100, there's a, probably a very small role for gas, right? Like, um, but in the interim, what I would say is, you know, emissions reductions now are a lot more valuable than theoretical emissions reductions 30 years in the future when we have this figured out or whatever. And even so, if we have a much less carbon intensive economy versus like what I'm trying to stress is the incumbent here is not gas versus some renewables. It's, it's gas versus the 245 gigawatts of coal that are commissioned. So we may have incentive to continue to use gas infrastructure by 2050, 2040, 2050. But, you know, I think we cross that bridge when we get there. Yeah, it's Rob here. I, <coughs> yeah, I had some statistics on because it, it's different for the measure of gas versus LNG. So if you say gas overall global demand in 2040 is coming down, it goes up and then comes down, that's true based on further a sustainable development scenario. Now let's look underneath that. What does that mean to LNG? Because what happens is the gas is needed, even though it's reduced significant, uh, somewhat in 2040, it's needed in a different place. And you'll see that the LNG demand between 2018 and 2040 is still almost double. So the LNG infrastructure is needed to get the stuff to where it's needed. So that's one, one of the maybe answers to your question. So it's not all of a sudden we run out of the need for LNG in 2040. That's, that's not what the SDS says. If you get underneath it, it's actually, it goes from 350 BCM to 630 BCM, almost, not quite double, but 80%. And then, then if you go even further in time, well, what happens in 2075? You build all these pipes and whatnot. Well, there's something called hydrogen. And that's the dream too, that we can go to clean energy that's liquid. We can use that same infrastructure. We can pull gas out of the ground in Northeastern BC. We can turn it into hydrogen in a hub. We can sequester any CO2 that's made in the, in the product in that process or use it in other products and use those same pipes and infrastructure for transporting hydrogen. So 
I think there is, I mean, you have to think big on this stuff and you have to think about possibilities. I think people <clears throat> like to throw darts <clears throat> at the LNG thing and say you're gonna, it's stranded infrastructure. When in fact, I think the IEA, even in this recent report, talks about gas infrastructure <clears throat> being an enabler for hydrogen in the future. Didn't want to go there, but Sorry. that's a whole other can of worms. Yeah. <laughs> Well, no, don't be wrong. I, I love talking about hydrogen, but uh, we'll. Uh, okay. Last but very not not the last. One of the last but very important points to make is that there's a very credible case that BC's LNG is among the lowest or the lowest carbon intensity in the world. So if we, the IEA when it does its modeling, uses. Um, carbon intent, it doesn't have a specific value for BC or that kind of, it uses kind of regional carbon intensities. But just to say that if we account for the lower carbon intensity and the more LNG that we export from BC, actually it's the more greenhouse gas emission reductions we get on top of that sustainable development scenario. Right? So we have this LNG intensity number of 0.16 tons of carbon per ton of LNG. That's lower than any other uh, LNG facility in the world. Uh, in the Montany, where the gas, most of the gas comes from, there's very low formation CO2 compared to other shale reserves. Uh, BC is basically the closest LNG exporting jurisdiction, so less emissions for transport. So that means that the more LNG we can export from here, the the lower green, global greenhouse gas emissions below that SDSS, SDS scenario. Um, so just very quickly, just to summarize, gas demand grows by 20% in the SDS. Gas takes the largest energy share of any energy source in the SDS. Gas consumption in China and India increases two to three times. And it's used in every single sector. Most of the new gas demand in these regions is supplied by LNG. And LNG exports from North America are 150 BCM, so that's double our exports to the US. So it's a huge, huge possible opportunity. Maybe, uh, uh, Tyler, I'd like to just mention a couple of things and then hear sure. your uh, reflections on them. Um, so, uh, 0.16, um, the uh, Kinemat uh, project, Kinemat LNG that we were just talking about this morning that Chevron is trying to sell half interest out. Um, I think we, I met with them last week and I was just looking for the number but I can't find it but I'm sure it is 0.024 mm -hmm. um, because 0.16 is not based on full electrification and Kinemat was pretty much fully electrified and they were going to get it down to 0 0.024. Mm -hmm. And in the Saguenay project uh, that some of us know about in Quebec, it's also fully electrified. I don't know what its numbers are. Um, and the scenario that, that uh, FNCI is having um, evaluated by BC Hydro is based on fully electric. Um, that's just the first point. And then the second point, um, we haven't met with the BC uh, Business Council yet, uh, but we're going to. And we already know what they're going to say. Um, at least we know one of the things they're going to say because I talked to them already. <laughs> um, and it's, uh, it's that, well, it's great if, uh, if we've got the cleanest product in the world and we've got enough of it that we can make a difference. I think your mic's off. It's great that we have a, the cleanest product in the world and that we've got plenty of it to sell. Um, but if our price is too high, no one's going to buy it. They're going to buy LNG from Qatar or somewhere else that's cheaper. Um, and, and then they're going to make the competitiveness uh, pitch. Sure. Um, and some of the things that you were just talking about, like the amortization rules, um, you know, how quickly you can write down investments, are things that I expect they're going to be talking to the First Nations leadership about because it's 
it is a policy question. Um, how do we make, if we're trying to make the cleanest LNG in the world, how do we make sure people buy it and displace coal with it? Um, because otherwise, we're not going to achieve the goal. Yeah. And so I'm just sort of fast forwarding to what's coming as we try and build out a full scenario of what, how, how to make this really happen. Yeah, it's a, it's a global commodity market. And the Chinese are more or less interested in the cheapest gas. Gosh, I, I have a question just on your comment, Alan. In the scenario, in the thank you, in the scenario that BC Hydro will uh, reveal, does that include uh, the rate, the rate forecast? Is it more about infrastructure and technology, or is it about rate design too? Because that that that's that's the important piece. You're sharing about electricity rates. Yeah. Participant exiting. Andrew Hamilton. I don't know the answer to that yet. I just want to make one more, maybe a comment or a response to your question. Well, the good question is, it's about, you, you stated, well, if we build the most efficient LNG in the world, how do we make sure people will sell it or that we're competitive, right? Or that we're competitive. But I guess my point is, if we're not competitive, we won't build it. Okay, it won't get built. None of this stuff will happen. And so at this point, in the last five years, we have one major project that's going forward. And in the U.S. Announcing participants. In the U.S., in that same five-year period, they've announced eight projects, and they're building these things like gangbusters. So I guess my point is, it's great to have an all-electric, like the Chevron uh, Kitimat LNG. But is it competitive? And I think the owners are having a hard look at that right now and selling down. There, there's issues about being all electric in terms of being competitive. I agree uh, with it. Obviously, uh, it's, it's an important factor. And um, as was raised uh, with us um, when we met with DC Hydro last, um, it makes a big difference who pays for the infrastructure um, that's going to electrify, or create the opportunity to electrify. And the provincial government and federal government recently signed an MOU for $680 million to invest in electrification in the Northeast, which is substantially going to help to electrify gas production facilities, and which are currently direct drive. And and one of the things that we have to consider is the electric, the electrical infrastructure required to electrify the pipes and plants is massive. And where is that money going to come from? Um, because that could make it competitive, according to some of the components we've been talking to, who are interested in full electrification. And the Saguenay project is in the regulatory process now as a fully electrified project. So we're doing it, and and it's a matter of how do we need what do we need to align in order to make it happen, in in order to make it competitive. And there's a number of different levers that can be pulled, and obviously the consequences of not doing it. Um, well, we're going to talk about that after lunch. Well, I'll, can I please jump in? Can you um, can you flip ahead two 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 slides? Next one, please. So here's the, here's the consequence of not doing it. So this is the emissions per gigajoule of LNG. Here's Fortis's facility in Tilbury Island. Here's a facility on the US Gulf Coast. So when we talk about, well, you know, um, Paul's question, what about all this, you know, locking in to 2030? Well, I got news for you. We're locking in right now to higher emissions LNG sources. So this is, this is, these are the upstream, these are the production level emissions, and these are the emissions that come from consuming the gas in China. This is double that 
of here in BC or with our facility here at Tilbury. So the issue is the demand for this gas is there. Who's going to supply that? Because these facilities, five of them have been commissioned or built in the past you know, three or four years. They're now on the landscape for the next 30, 40 years at this emissions footprint. And just to, oh yeah, here's what it's displacing. So uh, we have signed a deal with Top Speed Energy to provide about 50,000 gigajoules of LNG a year. It's, it's, again, real examples, it's not going to the power sector. It's going to a couple industrial facilities in the Shandong province. One's a textile mill, another's a chemical producer. It's going for direct consumption in those, in, in those industries. This is what it's offsetting. So it's approximately half of the emissions intensity of what the incumbent fuels are in those industries in China. The issue is, this is all in 25% more emissions than what's going on here in BC. So the question is, what is climate leadership in this world that we're living in right now? Is it cutting off our nose to spite our face? They're saying, oh, we have the lowest emissions stuff here, but mm, it's, not the, it's not the pure path. It's not the righteous 100% renewable. So therefore, we're actually going to have 25% more emissions globally. So you, can you just do the math on the displacement so that we can put it in context of BC emissions overall? Um, yeah, so... That 55,000 gigajoules that we're sending a year, we estimate that'll re reduce about 100,000 tons. So this is actually quite a small ship. This is nothing, this is a hundredth the time of L LNG Canada. But 100,000 tons, that's basically removing every passenger diesel vehicle off the roads in BC. So it's still a lot. 100,000 tons of GHGs. Yeah. The full facility, if we s export everything, it could reduce about a million tons of life cycle emissions. We'll get into that a bit later on, on life cycle analyses. But just to say, on a global basis, you know, a million tons isn't a lot. Uh, BC is 60 million. But Tilbury isn't that big. So this goes to show that um, there is a significant potential with the larger facilities.